Most of you will recognize this slight paraphrase that I'm going to share at the beginning part of my meditation with you this morning. It is the best of times. It is the worst of times. It is the age of wisdom. It is the age of foolishness. It is the epoch of belief. It is the epoch of incredulity. It is a season of light. It is a season of darkness. It is the spring of hope. It is the winter of despair. Just changing the tense of one of the words, I have shared with you the opening of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It kind of sums up where we are as people in this country and also around the world. This is a time of Lent, which comes from the word that it means lengthening. The days are getting longer. Some of the buds are on the trees already. Some flowers are popping up from the ground. It should be a joyous time, a time of light, a time of, of hope, a time of spring. But in the midst of all this, there's also a time of darkness a time of despair, a time of incredulity, a time of despair and darkness. Interesting that in my life I have never experienced uh, life change so quickly as it has for us in our country. Um, I went away down to, to Florida. It started out not in the best of uh, conditions. I. Uh, Got stuck on a three-hour delay by the Bay Bridge from uh, Delaware to Maryland, and by doing so, I managed to miss the auto train. It was to take my wife and I down to Florida. So for the second time in three years, we wound up having to drive all the way down to Florida. We had already planned to drive all the way back, so that wasn't a surprise. But when I left, the stock market was doing wonderfully well and high, and everybody was excited about how the economy was great. Uh, employment was almost full, one of the best uh, on record for our country. Everything seemed so sweet and positive. Yes, we knew in the back of our minds that maybe having spring come this early was not the best thing in terms of the environment. Uh, we do face that with climate change and the melting of huge amounts of ice. But we can push that back just for the moment and enjoy the present and what we had that day, not realizing that very close to us there was going to be, be darkness. This parable or the story from Jesus uh, talking to the blind man has a lot to offer us today. But there is a lot of blindness in this world. A lot of blindness. In some way, I think all of us are born blind. This is what I mean by that. None of us are born with infinite knowledge and wisdom. We come into this world raised by loving parents, we hope, who have their set of ideas, their set of beliefs, and we take them on as a young child once we differentiate ourselves from them, and we kind of believe what they teach us. And sometimes we do rebel against that, but most times that becomes the vision, that becomes the framework upon which we base our lives and base our values and how we live our lives. It's hard for us to see a different vision, a different way of being. So we find ourselves blinded in many ways by looking through uh, our eyes with not a great vision from the side. And it happens to all of us. When I was down in Florida, I heard nothing except a very little bit about this virus that was coming uh, or happening in China and might become, might become a epidemic around the world. I pushed it to the back of my mind. I was having so much fun out there shooting pictures of birds and going around and enjoying some of the zoos down there and seeing friends. And when I began to hear about some of the hysteria up here, about uh, going to stores and buying things out, uh, I was surprised and felt that the media and people were basically overreacting to, to what was going on up here. 
That was my blindness. I just couldn't see or experience what was happening. In my life, I've never seen society change so quickly. I was born in 1943, so I missed World War I and World War II, basically. I didn't know about it. I wasn't watching TV much, I was having too much fun, so I didn't really get involved much with the Korean War. But later on, when I was uh, an adult and going on to get a master's in counseling, I had to do a genogram, which was a four or five generation study of who my family was. That was quite a challenge because we had a very small family and not many people having children, including myself, so it's hard to go back and find the names. But what struck me in going back was the year 1918. A third to a half of my family was wiped out in 1918. That was the influenza, sometimes called the Spanish flu. Now, in studying more about that, I realized that around the world, 50 million people die for influenza. Of course, they didn't even know back in those days what caused the flu. And so they were lost as to what they could possibly do to help a lot of these people. But it was amazing to know that that number of people who died, 50 million, were more than what died in battle of all nations in World War I and in World War II. And those people who were also bombed in their own city, the people who were not, who were not combatants. 50 million people. Well, so far this hasn't gotten to be that point, but the problem is that as a people, we don't know. We're blind to what this virus can cause. We know a little bit about it from China, and now, of course, also from Italy and other parts of the world. But we're still babes in the woods when it comes to fully understanding this. And it presents to us a sense of fear, a sense of being uncomfortable. And some way we like that story that I loved growing up as a child about the men in a boat in India who were trying to describe an elephant. I think you remember the story. The first blind man puts out his hand and touches the side of the elephant and says, Ah, the elephant is much like a wall because it is so smooth. The second blind man puts out his hand and touches the trunk of the elephant and says, Out round, the elephant is just like a snake. The third man, blind man, puts out his hand and touches the tusk of the animal, the elephant, and says, how sharp. It is like a spear. The fourth blind man puts his hand out, touches the leg of the elephant, and says, how tall and round it must be the trunk of a tree. The fifth blind man reached out his hand and touched the ear of the elephant and said, how wide. An elephant is like a fan. The sixth blind man puts out his hand and touches the tail of the elephant and says how thin an elephant is like a rope. In their blindness, they can only see a part of what was going on uh, in their lives. They had part of the truth, but not the whole truth, because they couldn't see the whole thing. An argument came among them as to who was right. That happens to us today. I think a lot of us have a partial view of what is going on, not only with this virus situation, but around the world. And we don't know what to do for sure. I had a poster that I did not bring in today, but it says, you know, we are the world. It shows a picture of uh, Mother Earth, and it's in a little basket being cared for. You know, we must take care of this Earth. But we're not doing that as a people. And we could probably not have seen in advance what was happening with this, neuro, with this virus that has come upon us. But maybe we could have had a little broader vision and understanding uh, and preparing for this situation to come upon us. Because it has in the past and probably will be also coming upon us uh, in the future as well. We'll return to the Gospel lesson today. We find that Jesus has approached the man who is blind. And now the cure for this man is to take mud, first the saliva of Jesus, make mud out of the dirt and put it on his eyes. How horrible is that? <laughs> I mean today, think about this. We're told to be six feet apart. 
uh, that the uh, virus can be spread by touching our eyes. It can be spread by little particles of uh, saliva or from a sneeze or from a cough. And here is Jesus taking saliva from his mouth, making mud and putting it on the man's eyes. We'd all be grossed out by that today and so fearful about what's going on with that. But of course, in the story of the blind man, born blind from birth, there's also a kind of a metaphor that's going on here. Because sight, in this case, also speaks about our belief and our faith. Somehow this man believes Jesus. He allows him to do so. So desperate is he to have vision, to have sight in his life. I can't imagine being born blind. I've heard some people say that it's harder to be blind after you're born because you've gotten used to seeing, but somebody born blind never has had experience of seeing, it, of seeing anything. And they seem to be able to cope with that loss more than those who have a partial blindness. I am not sure about that myself. I think it would be very tough to be born blind, to be blind at any point uh, in life. I just had a cataract surgery and I was amazed that I was able to see out of my left eye much better than I had in the past. But in some ways I am still, still very much blind. Now this gentleman is told to go and wash in the Siloam. And he, that's about the distance of about five football fields. Now can you imagine this beggar walking through the streets with mud caked on his eyes going to wash it off? I mean, that's a sight to behold. And I'm sure people are saying, isn't he the beggar? What the heck is he doing now? The guy's going absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. He does so, and then he sees. He now has partial sight. He does not yet understand and recognize who it was that gave him this wondrous gift of sight. does not fully yet understand who this person was that has given us the ability to see life and be life in a new and exciting way. There is much blindness that follows uh, in this passage. I was going to announce ahead of time and forgot to have you record in your own listening to this or reading this passage how many times you experienced blindness uh, in this passage? The first time is when the disciples, who should know better, says to Jesus, Who sinned that caused this man to be blind? <laughs> Back in those days, you know, if you had some kind of infirmity, if you had difficulties in your life, then you must have sinned. Or your parents have sinned. After all, aren't the sins of the parents visited upon the children to the next generation? So, some scripture tell us. And the disciples believe that. And so Jesus has to inform them to increase their vision, to have them see in a different way. It is not sin that causes this to happen. But there is an opportunity here for you to see the power of God through me. And that's the first time we experience blindness, not just in the man, but in some of the closest followers of Jesus. I think today, some of the closest followers of Jesus will also suffer from some kinds of blindness. They don't fully understand what is the gospel and the love of God that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Now, second, the second time we experience blindness in this passage that when neighbors refuse to accept the man for who he is. And here's a person that sat there begging for years and years. This can't be the man. They have pigeonholed him into a certain category. And don't we do the same thing? But they have pigeonholed him into a category. This can't be him. But it can't be him. He says, I am. I am the same person except now I see. Now I have the beginnings of a different kind of faith of how we are to live our lives. They bring him into the Pharisees and we come to another area of blindness. They ask him, how is it that you now see? When he tells them how it happened, all they can think about is ritual. All they can think about is that this person who healed him, they think, possibly, did it on the Sabbath. And that's a violation of working on the Sabbath. Therefore, this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He's not of God. What's the matter with you? You've got to be wrong. 
rather than celebrate this man's new vision, new sight. All they could think about was their power structure, their traditions, their way of doing things, and looking to find fault. It reminds me of the phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and we find it to be the case these days. You know, so many times someone tries to do something good, and wants to get back for it in turn, is a slap in the face, or some kind of penalty, or a fine for what they're doing. Again, the fourth time of blindness is when, even after all of this, the Pharisees cannot believe this is the same person. So they go to the parents and ask, is this your son? Of course he's my son. Of course I recognize my son. And they ask them again, well, how is it now that he sees? Well, ask him. He's an adult. Don't ask us. <laughs> blindness, blindness, and blindness. Time and time again in this passage, we find that they refuse to accept the grace and the love and the light that allows us to have a new kind of vision that comes to us in our faith in Jesus Christ. We are disciples of Moses. We know God has spoken to Moses, so they say. As for this man, we do not know who he is or where he comes from. They know. They do know all about him. They were jealous of him. Suspicious of him, yes, but the study by this time would have known who this man of God happened to be. And again, when the man who was showing a great degree of strength and growth, remember he started out with just being blind, knowing that somebody had brought him to, to sight, now is kind of defending him. He says to them, you know, uh, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but he certainly healed me. And if he's a sinner, God doesn't really listen to sinners, so he must be a man from God. That's a lot of strength. A man who one time recently was just begging in the street. There is a spiritual growth that is happening to him. A kind of sight that goes beyond vision. A sight that leads him to faith. Which finally happens in the end of the, the uh, story, where he is confronted once again by Jesus, who says, uh, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, who is this? He says, I am that person. And he believes and goes forth. Of course, for what his uh, now faith, the, you know, the blind man is, of course, thrown out of the synagogue. He is still uh, separated from his community of faith. Very, very difficult for him, you know. And the Pharisees, right to the very end, some of them, not all of them, we're still reluctant to understand what had taken place uh, in this miracle today. So, how do we approach this today in this time of crisis as, as a nation? I know there's been a lot of criticism, but I believe it's not really the time for criticism. First, you want to give thanks to those persons who are showing the love of Christ today. I think of the people who are in the hospitals, all the medical staff, without the proper equipment even, uh, taking the risk with their lives to reach out and love and serve the people who are most in need. I think of the doctors especially who are going to have to agonize if you don't get enough respirators, if you don't get enough masks, if you don't get enough things to help these patients, they're going to be a terrible choice facing us. Who shall live and who shall die? Based upon their age, based upon the possibilities of their being able to be be made well. I know my blindness when I first started out with this was saying, well, the media is making such a big fuss about this. Only a few people seem to have it. Yes, it's going to spread, but there are a lot more people that had the flu. Just a regular flu this year. There have been 18,000 people that have died in this country from the flu. But then I realized that millions more have gotten the flu and have survived. And the ratio uh, people who survive, people to, who die from this illness of the flu is less than 1%. In fact, it's 0.01% of people have a fatal result from the flu because most people have gotten the vaccine for it. There is no vaccine right now for COVID-19. Now, for what's happening is that the uh, fatality rate is about 3.4%. 3.4% of 
versus 0.01 percent. And for those in my age, uh, 60s, 70s and up, it's a whopping almost 10 percent will have a serious reaction to the, the, this virus and might die. If you're over 80, it gets to be 18 percent. 18 percent versus 0.01 for the whole population of those suffering from the flu. So we cannot satisfy ourselves just with that information. But rather than be critical, we need to think about how we can now work together as a people. We are all in this together, not just the United States, but the entire world needs to cooperate and work together to help us all out in this situation. I think the key for this is definitely love. Love can help us so much overcome our fears. I love the passage about from 1 John, you know, uh, there is no fear in love, for, for love casts out fear. And so, no matter where we are on this journey, whether you're right now a carrier, whether you are free from it that we know of because there's been not a lot of testing, whether you even have the disease right now, the thing to do is continue to love. Continue to love as God has loved us and still loves us. We never know what one day will bring forth in our lives, even an hour. We only know, the Bible says for us, now is the hour for us to serve, to reach out and love. And that's what we're doing. Think of those who are still working, who need to have protection. Think of those who have lost their jobs because they have been laid off, because restaurants are closed, stores are closed. We're at a very difficult time. Those of us who have the ability to give and help in some way can do so, and it is happening. Neighbors calling neighbors to find out if there's a need, they're going shopping, they're willing to go shopping for a neighbor. Somebody they don't even know because some of these neighborhood chains that have developed in our nation. We have um, a situation where people are still giving medical rides for the agency that I belong to. We have asked that people sit in the back seat and if they have uh, anything to put a mask on, if they can find a mask these days uh, for that medical ride, but we're trying to still stay normal in our contacts. Social distancing does not mean we lose contact with our neighbors and our friends and our family. In fact, now that we're stuck in our homes, maybe there's more time for us to be involved with caring for one another, the caring for each other in ways that we never thought about were possible. To whom much is given, Jesus says, much is expected. To whom much has been entrusted, even more expected. And so we are doing that. I know the deacons in the church, of which I am now one, have used a call down list to contact people to say, how are you doing? What's going on? Whether they're active in the church or inactive in the church, that's not important. Is there something that we can do to help? Is there something that the church can still do uh, six feet apart? Uh, we need to consider going to these restaurants and getting food takeout support some of these restaurants that are struggling now to even stay open and find ways to keep them going. So we try to diminish as much as we can the effect of what is happening to us. And then we pray. We pray for those who have the power and authority to use that in a way that will benefit not just those who have means, but to benefit those who are suffering the worst. I was in touch with Columbus House uh, in New Haven. They have about 175 people in two buildings, which they can't have. There's no way they can practice safe distancing with that many people. So they're trying to find other ways to get them to different places where they could be to be safer. You know, These are the ones who are most in need. And besides that, a lot of people who go to homeless shelters is not in their, their makeup to want to stay in all day long. They want to be out on the street. It has been so hard, so hard for those people. We need to withhold judgment of them and find ways to reach out and care for them and love them in powerful ways. We're on this journey, my friends. We can't let our blindness uh, separate us from those who most need our help. And if we have the blessings to do so, we must share those blessings. Because that's how we ought to live our lives. 
There is no power that can ever separate us from God's love, not even COVID-19. Let's be aware of that, affirm that, celebrate that, and while respecting the distance. You know, we distance each other, and says to me today, you know, don't get too close to those who are there today, you know. And she's concerned for me, and I'm concerned for me. But the whole issue of social distancing is not what might harm you, but what, what might harm somebody else. Even though I feel healthy, my being somewhere might be a problem for somebody else who has the illness. And so we need to be attentive to what science is saying to us about how we can get through this as a people. And then going forward, let's see if we can find more money, not for destruction and war, but more for peace and more for saving our environment. That all may enjoy the blessings. That all may hear the birds sing. That all may enjoy the flowers that bloom in the spring and bring an end to this darkness. Amen.